wasn't really much of a reader until the pandemic, and it really worked out for this episode. Welcome to Episode 9 of Therese Talk. I'm your host, Therese Maine. By day, I co-host a morning radio show on a network of stations across New York and Pennsylvania. By night, I'm podcasting. If you're a woman like me who loves Jesus and just wants to serve her family and community a little better, you are in the right place. In this episode, what God revealed to me in the emergency room, plus some tips to make your Christmas a little simpler and a little more focused on God. But first, an author who's been so transparent with her life to help you grow closer to Jesus in your life. Her new book is called Forgiving What You Can't Forget. Lisa Turkhurst is with us. Did you ever think that when you started on this journey that it would go the way that it has No. And it's interesting. You know, I think sometimes I'll have people say to me, you know, wow, Lisa, you being in ministry sure has cost you a lot. Like, because you're in ministry, you have this big target on you. And, and I'm always quick to say, I don't really think that's the way God worked it. I really think that God saw all that I was going to walk through in this life. And he gave me this gracious, amazing gift of being in ministry so that I would have my full-time job be studying God's word and walking through, um, you know, his word as my full-time job and what a gracious and good gift that God gave me. So I don't think I came under this attack because I was in ministry. I think I was going to come under this attack and God placed me in ministry. And I'm very grateful for that. And there's always different ways to look at what you've gone through, because I look at what you've gleaned from your life experiences, and I'm thankful, because if you hadn't gone on the journey that you did, if you hadn't walked so close to the Lord when you did, you may not have been able to put the words on paper that have helped so many other people. Yes. And so I am grateful that I get to help other people. I still wish with my whole heart that this story of my husband being unfaithful was not our story. I really do for his sake, for my sake, for my kids, everything, but I can't change it. But what I can do is let God use it. And so I am so, so grateful that I have the opportunity to share with other people and help other people because it's an intensely brutal journey. It's a lonely journey. journey, And so I know when I share bits and pieces of my story, it helps other people not feel so alone. The way that you were so honest and transparent, like I can't even imagine ever being Was that just out of necessity that you knew that if you didn't say something, people would draw their own speculation? I mean, how how did that go when you when you finally were able to come out and say, look, this is what's happened in our family. Uh, It's this awful, horrible thing. But here's how we're proceeding. And because if not, then then who knows what people would have thought. And minds are often worse than the reality. You know, I knew when. I first discovered what was happening, that it was going to be important to try to allow my husband to go on a healing journey and honestly try to allow me and the kids to go on a healing journey without the added weight of public opinion, because that's a really heavy weight to place on some very private pain. But um, after 18 months of holding it private, um, some things were happening again that were not great. And so um, I had already written a blog post and Art knew that if certain things happened, then the blog post would be a consequence of those choices. And so it was important to follow through with that boundary that I'd drawn. And it wasn't at all that I used the public statement against art. That's not what it was about at all, but it was something we both agreed to ahead of time. And because I live such a public life and my family lives such a public life, things that were chosen were starting to leak out in rumors. And it was really important that the story not be told with some kind of scandalous rumor mill, you know, being the narrative. 
it was important to me and to my kids and even now to art that the story was just told with truth and um, just very basically letting people know what we are walking through, asking for their prayer, but giving very few details. And Art would say now that was simultaneously the worst day of his life and the best day of his life because and, and I look back on it and I say it was my worst day and my best day too. It was the worst day of the entire journey, but it was also the day that Art on his own went and checked himself into a treatment center and he stayed. And I can look back now and see that, wow, you know, even in that, even that day that was so awful, um, God, God somehow wove even that in the direction of good. And so now Art would say one of the reasons that it was his best day, even though it was also his worst day, is because it freed him from wondering who knew and who didn't know the story. So now when he walks into any room, he doesn't have to spend emotional energy trying to figure out who knows. He just assumes everyone knows. But he gets a choice to use that emotional energy and decide how he walks in the room as a villain or as a victim or as a man walking in victory. And he chooses to walk in victory and he's always the safest person in any room because people know that he's been through really, really hard stuff. So they feel safe with him to share their stuff too. Were you surprised by what happened when that all was put in the light? Because so often we have this shame, this guilt that covers these things that have happened, not even necessarily things that we have done, but things that have happened. And we become so burdened down by what the enemy is telling us about what people are going to think. And then you put it out there and it's like, oh, God used that for good. Yeah, because I didn't think that our story was going to end in reconciliation, but I was very determined to live a redemption story with God. So I just kept pursuing redemption with God and my healing. And, you know, Art and I did not live together for two and a half years. So it was a very long journey. There was nothing quick about it or easy about it. And I would say even now, you know, we're still in this process of healing and healing is messy and it's hard. Um, but there are good parts to it too. And I think we've kind of just hit this place in our healing journey where we just have to look at each other and say, you're human and I'm human, you're healing and I'm healing. Some days you're hurting and some days I'm hurting, but we're going to get through this. And we're trusting that on the other side of all of this hurt and heartbreak, that we're going to see a beautiful beautiful redemption that God is going to do something on the other side of all of this. That's glorious, not just for us, but, but to help other people who feel so alone in this process. What if there hadn't been reconciliation? Would you feel different about God? That's a good question. You know, I think a lot of people assume that the reason I'm able to forgive is because there was reconciliation. But I think what they don't understand is actually the reconciliation made the forgiveness harder <laughs> because, you know, in the Bible, and I studied forgiveness in the Bible for over a thousand hours. I was honestly studying it that long because I was looking for a loophole. I thought, surely there's an exception. God surely doesn't mean that we're supposed to forgive everything, right? Um, and I discovered he absolutely does command for us to forgive, but it's not so that we can give the person who hurt us an unfair gift they don't deserve. What forgiveness really is, is God's gift to us to help the hurting heart heal. And when I finally understood like, wow, God did this for me. He didn't do this to me. He did this for me. He, he, he provided this command to forgive for my healing, then that started to change everything. But when we forgive, while forgiveness is a command by God, reconciliation is very dependent on a whole lot of factors. 
And so I was pursuing forgiveness way before I knew whether reconciliation would ever be possible or not. I had pretty much given up on reconciliation for us. And so the reconciliation surprised me as much as anyone. Um, But the reason that I say that reconciliation sometimes makes forgiveness harder rather than easier is because the more access that person has to your life, the more close they are to you, the more they have the opportunity to hurt you again. And sometimes it's the second time or the third time that they do something hurtful that makes that forgiveness journey that much more complicated. Now, I'm not saying at all that once Art and I renewed our vows that he was unfaithful again. He was not. Sometimes I think reconciliation makes forgiveness even more complicated. The latest book is called Forgiving What You Can't Forget. You talk some about hard hearts and soft hearts, that hard hearts are more likely to shatter, whereas soft hearts aren't broken as easy. You're kind of more moldable with God. But how do you walk back into a relationship, an intimate relationship with someone who has hurt you deeply and keep a soft heart? You know, I also wrote in the book, The Blessings of Bitterness, which seems to be like, what? That doesn't make any sense at all. But the two kind of go hand in hand. And what I mean is not at all that we should be bitter or giving people permission to entertain bitterness. That's not it. It's just bitterness doesn't often visit the cold, hard hearts. Bitterness often visits that person who threw their arms open wide and they dared to love deep. So they got hurt really deeply. And so the blessing of bitterness is is it shows you have the ability to love deep and big and all complete. You have that ability, but you've been hurt. And so we must remember that into that loss Every, every relationship that goes through trauma, there's a sense of loss there. And into that loss, bitterness wants to move in, but it doesn't just want to be a feeling. It wants to consume you and be your only feeling. And it's so easy for that bitterness to come in and almost feel like we can use it to protect ourselves from getting hurt from that other person. But bitterness, it won't just sit as something hard in your heart. It, it wants to take over and turn you into someone that you would never want to be. And it does have such a propensity to harden our hearts. And it's when our hearts get even more hard that when people bump into us again, it's those hard hearts that can break and shatter. But if you keep a soft heart, you can bend with some of people's humanity. You can bend with sometimes when they lay down an offense, just because someone lays down an offense doesn't mean you have to pick it up and carry it with you and make it part of who you are and how you live that day. And so I think it's so important to really examine What is the condition of my heart? Is it soft and bendable and flexible and able to absorb some other, sometimes when other people make mistakes or they do something that hurts us, or is it in such a bitter, hard place that it takes just the least little thing to shatter us all over again? I'm not sure if you would call it moving on, moving through, just moving forward. But this idea that we are going to come together now and, and your family to be a family again, you know, even as a culture, we're all kind of in this place, very uncertain about what these days are hold, how can we develop traditions? How can we experience joy? You know, how can we even have Christmas when we've had kind of a tumultuous past, whether it's something you've been through or just what we've been through as a nation? Well, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, when we wake up each day, forgiveness isn't just supposed to be for the hard and horrific of our life. It's supposed to be as much a part of our daily process as Anything else we do, eating, breathing, sleeping, walking, and forgiving. I mean, that's sort of the rhythm of life. And when Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter six, he said, this is then how you should pray. And he gives an introduction to the good 
will of God. And then he, he says it's a daily prayer by saying, give us today our daily bread. And then the rest of the Lord's prayer is about confession and forgiveness. And I've been astounded by that. Like if I was given that task to write this ultimate prayer that people would point to and say, that, that's how you pray right there. I don't think I would have made such a big deal about forgiveness being part of the prayer. And yet, because Jesus knows the hurting human heart, he made it like the focus of most of that prayer. And so it's clued me in that if he included it in this prayer that's supposed to be prayed daily, then I think I'm not supposed to just work on forgiving the things that have happened, but forgiving the things that will happen. And so I wrote in the book, the best time to forgive is before we're ever offended. And so can you imagine how much better this world would be, especially in the times that we're in right now, marching to the holidays, having gone through this you know, crazy election with so much tension of 2020, so much uncertainty and unknowns and everything. Can you imagine how amazing it would be if we all, before we got out of bed every morning, decided I'm going to send forgiveness ahead so that it's it's waiting for me in every space I walk into today. And so maybe at 7 a.m., you send, a, send forgiveness ahead to the coffee shop that you're going to walk into at 9 a.m. And you walk into that coffee shop at 9 a.m. And some dude is in there and he is just flat out rude to you. But what if you could just, instead of getting so swept up in that emotional chaos, what if you could just say to yourself, no. I already sent forgiveness ahead in this situation. I have traded all that drama for an upgrade. And just because he laid down an offense doesn't mean I have to pick it up and carry it with me and, and let it hijack my emotions for the day. So you just look at that guy and just say, you know what? You do you, boo. Like, it's okay if you're having a bad day, but I already forgave you this morning. So God bless you. And you just keep marching on. And I wonder if maybe some of us need to do that as we think about our holiday tables, as we think about interacting with family members that even if we want them to change, chances are 2020 probably didn't help them naturally change, you know, or even as we get stuck in some crazy conversations about politics or even about the weather or about, you know, the pandemic and mask wearing or not wearing masks, you know, all the stuff, it seems like there's hardly anything we can talk about today without it stirring up this chaos inside of people. And I guess what the Lord what I discovered, what the Lord has provided for us in this beautiful opportunity is that confession quiets the chaos inside of me. And when I confess that I need God's forgiveness and God's forgiveness flows to me on a daily basis, I must let it then flow through me to other people. Forgiveness isn't based on my determination. Forgiveness is made possible by my cooperation with what God has already provided to keep my heart clean and walking toward healing. Sometimes God takes us through difficult experiences because he has something he wants us to do or something he wants us to learn. So recently, I found myself as a patient in the emergency room. Don't worry, nothing ended up being wrong, but I had to go there, right? And as I'm getting ready to leave, being discharged with a clean bill of health, all of a sudden, I feel God, the Holy Spirit, asking me to ask the woman who's in the next little partitioned area if she wants someone to pray for her. And I'm like, oh, Lord, that's so uncomfortable. You want me to go up to a stranger and ask if if they want someone to pray? How about, how about this? How about if I just pray for her right here? And so there I sat in the hospital bed underneath the fluorescent lights, asking God to intervene on this woman's behalf for what was hurting her that night and just asking for divine healing and revelation. And as soon as I said, amen, I heard God say, ask that woman if she wants somebody to pray with her. And I thought, okay, 
this is going to be the big thing. This is going to be the reason I had to come to the emergency room. God is going to let me intervene for this woman and talk to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on her behalf. Okay. All right. This is a good thing. I just have to muster enough courage, right? And so I quietly tiptoe over to the curtain that's blocking her and I from each other. And I say, excuse me. And she says, yes. And I say, would you like someone to pray with you? And she says, nah, I'm good. And I was a little taken aback because this isn't how it went in my head. I mean, I was going to intervene on her behalf to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so I said, okay, well, have a good night. I hope you feel better. And I left and I kind of laughed a little bit on the inside. Like, God, I thought you had this big thing for me, this big job you were going to have for me to do. And she said, nah, I'm good. And then God showed me so clearly, it wasn't about me praying for her. He didn't tell me to pray for her. He didn't tell me to heal her. He didn't tell me to put hands on her. He said, ask her if she wants prayer. And in that, I was obedient. I asked her. Now, I don't know why. Maybe somebody else is going to ask her to pray later on and she'll say yes because of that experience. Maybe she'll have a fleeting thought about God and it'll stay a little bit longer because that woman stopped to ask me if I want prayer. Maybe it'll make her ask somebody else about prayer. I don't know. And that's not my business. And that's where we get tripped up sometimes. We want to know the entire picture, the entire plan. But the thing is, we are to do exactly what God has asked us to do and not one bit more. And sometimes we get caught up, you know, in scripture verses. We take them a little bit further than what they actually say. And we can get into a lot of trouble with that because God has a purpose and he has a plan and he chooses to use each of us in that. But we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit to know exactly what God is asking us to do and then doing it. So I've heard that people are dialing it back a little bit this year in terms of gift giving, you know, focusing more on the reason for the season. And I know, especially with our kiddos, we want to get them everything they want, or at least a whole bunch of stuff to open. But studies actually show that kids are happier when they have less. They're more imaginative and creative, and that makes them happier. Some parents at Christmas just do four gifts. And I've loved this idea for a long time. Something they want, something they need, something to wear and something to read. But if you want to take it down even one less gift, (laughs) you could use the Magi as your inspiration. You know, the Bible tells this account of these wise men, these Magi seeking out Jesus after his birth and bringing gifts, three gifts. We don't know how many Magi there were, but we know how many gifts. There was gold, there was frankincense, and there was myrrh. Now, the gold signified the fact that Jesus was royalty, the king of kings. So for your child's gold gift, make this the really valuable one, the one they really want. And then there's the frankincense. The frankincense was used as a sign of worship. They believed that while Jesus was fully man, he was also fully God. So your child's frankincense gift is something that helps them grow closer to the Lord. It might be a new Bible or devotional or cross necklace, something like that. And then we have myrrh. Now, myrrh is an unusual gift to bring a child because it's something that's used to prepare the body for burial. This acknowledged the fact that Jesus was born to die to take away our sins. So what do you get your kids as a myrrh gift? Well, focus on preparing the body. It might be a body wash or some lotion or cologne or maybe even some new clothes, something for their body. But it allows you to have a conversation on Christmas morning that digs into those gifts. And then you can talk about the best gift of all, the gift of Jesus. Have you been studying the Advent with your family? I love this book called 25 Days of the Christmas Story. And each day kind of covers a different part of the birth accounts with a little family activity. Now, I love this one talking about Caesar Augustus. Of course, Caesar's edict is the reason that Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem in the first place. And then there was no room at the inn, and we know the rest of the story, right? But how about this for a family activity? Make some Christmas 
Christmas cookies. And before you clean up, fill the sink with water and then select different things to put in the water. Count the ripples that each object makes. You might try a cookie cutter, a spoon, chocolate chips, maybe even a sprinkle. Is there something that doesn't make a ripple? Now, the lesson is, no matter how small something is, it makes a ripple. And the same thing is true in our life. Every single thing that we do, every action, big or small, affects the people around us. Now, some things that we don't even realize make a big impact, like Caesar Augustus. He probably had no idea that what he did in requiring the census would change all of history. What's your impact? Would you like to win a copy of 25 Days of the Christmas Story for your family? Go ahead and email us for your chance to win. The email address is win at fln.org. We'll select a winner on Friday, January 15th. Thanks for listening to this episode of Therese Talk, part of the Ministry of Family Life. If you'd like to find out more about what we do, along with radio and biblical counseling and performing arts, you can give at fln.org. Make sure you tell a friend, rate, and subscribe to this podcast.